Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event on uh, environmental rights and climate change in Europe, hearing the voices of minorities and indigenous peoples. This event has been organized by the Subcommittee on the Rights of Minorities and the No Hate Parliamentary Alliance of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And it is taking place as a part of the World Forum for Democracy, a major event on the Council of Europe's calendar every year. The theme of the Forum for this year, 2021, is Can Democracy Save the Environment? And this morning's event is contributing to the specific theme for the month of March, which is called Inequalities, Democracy and Climate Change. As the title of our event suggests, uh, we will be focusing on inequalities experienced by minorities and indigenous peoples in Europe, on how to ensure that their voices are heard and their rights respected. Now, I would like to thank uh, very warmly our four speakers today, uh, which are Susanna Israelson from the Arctic and Environmental Unit of the Sami Council. Uh, another guest is Florin Botonogu, president of the Policy Center for Roma and Minorities in Romania. His NGO is a member of the European Roma Grassroots Organizations Network, and he is also a consultant for the Roma Act joint program. Another guest uh, is Carol Sederberg, Director of Policy and Communications for the Minority Rights Group International. He has also played a leading role in the minority rights uh, group's re recent work on minorities and environmental rights. And Natalia Kobilart, who is a senior lawyer at the Registry of the European Court of Human Rights, she is also an environmental law specialist and has previously worked for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Dear speakers, welcome. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. We are very privileged to have you all of you with us uh, today and we are looking forward to your contributions, which uh, promise to be stimulating and thought provoking, interesting and also very concrete based on real life challenges across Europe. So now I will not use up uh, any more time. Let's move straight uh, to uh, our guest speakers, Susanna Israelson. I will start with you and the Sami perspective from the Arctic. Uh, the effects of climate change can already be observed in the Arctic region as weather patterns change, solar cap, uh, ice cap melt, uh, landscapes change, and both humans and wildlife are forced to adapt. Sami have lived in harmony with this environment since time began, yet now you experience a double burden. You are amongst uh, the first to be affected by the climate change, but at the same time, green solutions that are proposed uh, to reduce climate change globally also directly impact the Arctic environment. What challenges faced by Sami would uh, you like to alert us to? And what contribution can the Sami and the indigenous peoples more generally make to addressing climate change more effectively? Uh, now, uh, the floor is yours for eight minutes. and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I come from uh, the people of eight seasons. I've grown up in a reindeer herding family among reindeer herders, but the seasons as we know them are shifting. The Arctic as we know it is shifting. The Arctic, our homelands, is warming, and many of, of you might know that we risk to go up to four to six degrees or more increase in average temperature. The winters get warmer, they get wetter, the weather shift, it creates ice. We, the Sami, we live in close relationship with nature and the seasons, and these expected changes, which can already be seen in Sapmi, the area where we live, can lead to major changes within ecosystems and nature, and therefore also the resource foundation for our culture meaning that our culture and traditions, as well as our food security, is at risk of disappearing. The largest immediate threat to Sami culture and to reindeer herding 
in particular is not climate change per se, but the planned and already installed climate friendly initiatives intended to reduce CO2 emissions. The declared need to look for alternative energy sources to replace coal, oil and gas has, on national level, developed into initiatives planned on reindeer grazing lands. My mother has her roots along the Julev Ethno in Pjegalokta, where my grandparents decided to settle over 100 years ago. In the early 1940s and forward, 15 large power stations were built along the river, drowning huge areas of lands, grazing lands, fishing lakes and people's homes which to this day is underwater. Now, in the name of climate mitigation, they come to take the areas of my father's ancestors and part of the areas where current generations of reindeer herders reside, my generation. Within our reindeer herding community, a huge wind park is now planned with huge wind turbines that will take the whole area. However, our situation is not an isolated event or even one of a kind. Sapme has already been forced to give up land to these so-called green developments in all shapes and sizes. This, altogether with mines, roads and other already existing factors in society today, in a whole become big stressors. The green shift is nothing more than a continued extraction of resources in Sami areas. Wind turbines represent massive nature destruction with associated roads and power grids that transport energy to the market. The enormous size of these turbines today, they cast long moving shadows and therefore affect the surroundings. If humans don't want to live anywhere near these huge turbines, why would the animals? A turbine does not only take the piece of land it is placed on. Um, and in society today, we're so deeply rooted to see all possibilities of growth. But this is now and has for a long time been on behalf of our rights. But not only our rights, also our possibilities of growth and development. The majority society shift from fossil fuels to more environmentally friendly requires minerals that are coppers from mines established in Sami areas. Most mining plans are planned in Sapmi, as these are the areas the minerals are found. Authorities knowingly and willingly sacrifice our lands and our biodiversity in the name of the green shift, combined with monetary signatures. People in power often underline the importance of local economies, but our possibilities of living a local life is directly affected when new developments bring changes in our environment. Climate change is real and the seasons are changing and therefore causing challenges to our culture. Sami livelihoods and ways of life have good competence in dealing with changes. We deal with the conditions in weather, wind and surroundings all the time. If pasture is locked by ice in the winter, then we have to lead our herds to alternative areas where they may access the pager, or in worst case, they have to be fed. But paradoxically, the boom in industrial development of alternative energy sources, while with good intentions, are posing direct threats to our culture's existence on traditional territory. The loss of pasture lands is therefore one of the main challenges facing reindeer herders today. The fragmentation of grazing areas and a resulting loss of biodiversity is directly connected to climbing temperatures in the Arctic and increased human activity. The reindeer herding um, female goes back to her areas when she wants to cough. But what does she do when there are no areas to be found anymore? As one wise reindeer herder told me a few weeks ago, our geographical area for adaptation is shrinking, which means we also lose the possibility to adapt. 
Um, we must see more equitable distribution of the burdens where society at large takes a greater share of the responsibility. We expect climate justice. Justice as one of the main principles for democracy is a core value with that, within our society. While some claim that resources should be shared are the ones that should be shared in a just way, others claim that it is the individual's capability and possibility to function that should steer the distribution of what is just. Our demands for justice, however, stems from, stem from experienced and threatened possibilities to continue ways of life in close relation to nature and our traditional land areas. Still people ask, why this focus on justice within the debate on battling climate change? Well, I, as many others, claim that the climate change discourse cannot only focus on reducing emissions or who are the ones mostly affected by climate change. A larger focus should be put on specific groups and peoples in relation to justice aspect to prevent a distribu distributive development that contributes to the mar marginalization of groups and peoples. Here, unjust distribution uncovers how patterns of inequality and injustice repeats or strengthens, that is, the historical relations in terms of no or very few possibilities to st substantial influence over the decisions made regarding management of lands. Indigenous peoples worldwide cannot bear the heaviest burden for the society's need for a green shift. I can speak for our people. We need to be more involved in decision making in the countries where we reside today. Access to traditional lands, influence in decision making processes and the possibility to decide upon our social, cultural and economical development is crucial for our cultural survivor and also a part of our right to self-determination. Potential threats against traditional lands and ways of life are altogether threats to identity, values and cultural practices and therefore also the possibilities to pass these on to future generations. So, ways of life are being lost or at risk of being lost simply because they are not recognized and are devalued as ways of life. Our knowledge, traditions, values and livelihoods are fundamental to build sustainable societies and to restore the relationship between people and nature. We have lived on the lands and sustainably used them for millennia. Because of that, by constant observation and practice, our developed indigenous knowledge has provided adaptive skills to changing conditions over and between generations. This knowledge is now formally recognized within the international fora as important to respect, include and maintain regarding the work on climate change, adaptation and sustainable use and biodiversity. And now I'm referring to the Convention of Biological Diversity, the IPES, the um, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the Global Assessment Report, and the reports produced by the IPCC Working Groups, among others. Susanna, I'm sorry to intervene. I'm just uh, noting that uh, the eight minutes uh, are up, so maybe if you can finish this thought, and there will be, of course, time for questions and, and other points in the debate for you. Of course. But you can, of course, finish this sentence. I am not. I don't want to introduce like this. I just wanted to say that our knowledge is recognized, which also means that our worldview and, and values are as well. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Susanna. Uh, I think uh, you speaking about the sharing the resources, but also the burden is a very like, mind provoking uh, question and interesting insight. And uh, now, um, I'm sure there will be a lot of follow-up questions to, to ask you, Susanna. 
but now let's uh, let's uh, hear from all the other speakers before taking additional questions. Uh, now let's turn straight to our next speaker, Florin Botonogu from the Policy Center for Roma and Minorities in Romania. When minorities are marginalized in our societies, they unfortunately often find themselves among the groups uh, that are most exposed to the harms caused by environmental uh, degradation and pollution. Florin, you were one of the researchers for a recent very powerful report of the EEB and Ergo network called uh, Pushed to the Wastelands, Environmental Racism against Roma Communities in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, what environmental rights problems do you see um, in your work with the Roma communities in Romania? And are these issues properly understood and addressed uh, by the authorities? And how does racism come into all this? Uh, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Well, indeed, I participated to this uh, study and uh, I participated to other studies mostly related to the living conditions of the Roma, but this uh, environmental racism is strict, is very much related to the living conditions of Roma. So in just eight minutes, I'm just going to present uh, the hottest aspects, let's say, of the problem. I'm not going to give a lot of uh, numbers and so on and so on. So, uh, as you probably know, Romania has a lot of uh, environmental problems for all kind of issues. Uh, but what we see now, I'm most worried about what we see now in the public space. And uh, the trends that I personally observe is uh, what is called blaming the victim. I mean, uh, the poor people are to blame for the uh, environmental change, for the climate change, for the conditions, for the pollution especially. And uh, let me say that uh, according to the World Bank, uh, the late uh, more than 80% of the Roma population is uh, under the poverty line. So Roma here are a big uh, target group. Uh, let me first uh, start by introducing what are the most common environmental threats or uh, threats or hazards among Roma. Uh, first and very well known uh, is uh, related to the community and to the Roma that live uh, in the garbage pits or near, just near the garbage pits. Of course, it's uh, awful. I visited uh, some of them in Romania. And it's, uh, I mean, basically you cannot live there. I just wonder after, let's say, one field, one day of field visit, I was not feeling good with my lungs and everything. And how do these people can live there for, for gener even for generations, some of them, it's second generation now. Uh, another, uh, another hot issue is the issue of uh, waste management. Uh, poor people, uh, they say they, they, they burn, you know, there are small households that they burn some, collect the waste and then they burn it, some rubber, for example. And this is a main narrative that uh, from where the city, let's say, is polluted uh, in the media, let me say in the media. Another, uh, another related problem is to, is to the lack of sanitation. Uh, we are in 2021, but let me say that a lot of Roma communities and poor communities still lack water, uh, still lack uh, sanitation, a proper road, so on, so on. And a lot of people uh, use the toilet in the back of the yard, which brings a lot of pollution to the land. Uh, except for this let's say, common problems, uh, there is this human rights problem aspect of the problem, and there is this social aspect of the problem. And let me just give you an example to see how best it works. I visited a lot of years ago a community that was placed, not in housing, but in containers, just near the waste management facility of one city in Romania. So the smell was awful. 
every day like there. Uh, what happened, of course, it, it is a human rights problem and it is a social problem. Uh, I went there and I signaled the, 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 social, the social problem. And of course, the human rights NGO took over and went to the justice system. They went in Romania and I think this case went over, brought some European courts. What happened in reality was that uh, in, uh, in a matter of, uh, let's say, two or three years, they came to a decision. And uh, the decision was to find the municipality with a huge amount of money, basically 2,000 euro. Yeah, huge. In <laughs> so it's, uh, if I were a mayor and I would say I have 40 families, poor families, that live in this bad condition from the point of view of financial resources. What would be best for me to pay a fine of 2,000 euro or to relocate 40, 40 families? I think the first one. Yeah, if, if we are to judge like this. No matter, of course, there is a human rights issue and the disregard of Roma and I'll, I'll talk a bit later about this. And uh, uh, one of the most important uh, issues now in, in Romania is, the communi is re very much related to communication. And again, uh, let me give you two examples. There is a huge deforestation problem in Romania. Uh, the data says that uh, uh, there are 20 million cube meters deforestation, yeah, more than the official data which is a huge number, more than the official data, extra 20 million uh, cube meters of forest that disappears every year. So, you know how this is reflected in the media? The poor Roma that are extremely poor and have nothing to heat, they go into the forest and of course take some wood for the heating in the winter. And this is the stories that we see in the media. And another example, uh, it's related to the uh, burning of the waste. It's a, it's a huge, uh, huge problem here. And again, the media signals on the one hand that there are totally illegal networks, totally illegal uh, deposits, yeah, that collect the waste and burn it. Instead, you also see a lot of stories that say the poor people, look, we went in this village that is 30 kilometers away from the Bucharest, and we encountered two or three poor households that are burning rubber, for example. And from here, we have a huge story about the pollution in Bucharest. So, uh, on the other hand, you have these illegal de deposits that are burning. Let me say that uh, the workers in there are also poor, very poor. They are not paid formally. They have, they are on the black labor market with this, and every uh, the whole business is on the black market. Uh, and I just, I have to say this: uh, this morning, just by accident, <laughs> I was reading the media, and the uh, and the uh, high figure in the management of Bucharest. Uh, again related this pollution problem to to heating and uh, when they talk about bucharest they like to take proud and say bucharest is one of the cities with the highest gdp in the eu uh, but then again they say look we have poor people that still use wood and stove to heat in bucharest i i uh, I admit I saw some of these examples, but this is not not very much <laughs> met in Bucharest. There are poor communities in Bucharest, of course, and they use wood and all these kind of materials, but it's not a huge problem. And they say, okay, we have these communities. Uh, they they do not burn only wood; they burn other kind of materials, things like and. Uh, what is the solution? The solution is not to bring them from the Middle Ages to, to our age. The solution would be to make an electronic uh, register 
with these households and to put some GPS. I don't ask me more because I don't really understand why. And so <laughs> this is uh, what we see. Okay, of sorry, course. sorry to, to interrupt you, but uh, the time's getting two up, minutes. so I will ask you yeah, to finish. Two minutes, thank you. So uh, where does racism come, comes in? Basically in two forms. Uh, the common story is that Roma are like this. They very much like living in very bad conditions and they like to steal in order to live. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, uh, there is this, uh, this uh, truth that most of the Roma are poor and they use this kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, survival method, let's say. Uh, what to do? We need a very clear image of this uh, problem in Romania because we don't have it. And if you don't have a clear image, uh, then it's, uh, you know, all kinds of stories may, may appear. And of course, we need this uh, counteract these stories with facts because also in the media you have like uh, stories like 40% of the pollution in Bucharest comes from traffic, but that's it. No other story. Thank you. I'm sure we'll talk uh, more about it later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florin. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, like the double standards, biased view, uh, maybe from tabloid media and uh, some, some of the public. Uh, I think uh, I, I share this experience a little bit. Uh, so thank you for for this uh, for this insight. And now uh, there is uh, time for our next guest, uh, who will be Carol Sederberg from the Minority Rights Group International. Uh, Carol, the Minority Rights Group has been paying increasing attention to how environmental rights issues specifically affect persons belonging to minorities and indigenous peoples. Uh, you wrote uh, in our uh, MRG's uh, 2019 climate justice report of how in Bulgaria minorities are often forced into living in polluted areas and into engaging in illegal environmentally harmful activities because there are no economic alternatives for them. And uh, you wrote about how poverty and racism lock them uh, minorities into these harmful situations. In parallel, you wrote about how mining and natural gas extraction can destroy the livelihoods and nomadic lifestyles of indigenous peoples uh, in the Russian Federation, uh, leading to unemployment, forced migration to cities, and all the problems that go along with that. Uh, you've also underlined the need for transformative strategies to resolve these kinds of human rights violations and work together towards a sustainable future. From a minority rights-based uh, perspective, how do you think these issues can be addressed? Now we have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, thank the organizers as well for uh, offering me the chance to speak, and as well as my uh, co-presenters, uh, I've really enjoyed your very eloquent and powerful presentation so far. So I think ultimately, uh, and I've been working on these issues for about 15 years or so, um, <clears throat> the solution boils down to two key themes. One is ensuring land rights. Uh, the first step has to be securing uh, minorities and indigenous peoples' rights uh, to their lands. And here, when we're talking about indigenous peoples, uh, we're talking about a community's group rights. Um, so we worry that individual titling will simply lead to the breaking up of individual lands. In any case, land rights is the most important step. And with urban minorities um, like uh, the Roma, we're also talking about uh, the right to decent and adequate housing. Uh, so that's that's the first step. The second step, and this is so often missed out, is even though it is so fundamental to minority and indigenous people's rights, is the right to meaningful participation. Ultimately, everything boils down to this, that minorities and indigenous peoples must have a right to participate 
in a meaningful and informed way about, and then everything that concerns them, but then also decide on those uh, issues as well. And for indigenous peoples, there's the added strengthened right of free prior and informed consent. And Susanna, I, I just pick up on what you were talking about. It is so utterly shocking to me that the um, this issue of a placement of wind turbines, um, that the right of your people to free prior and informed consent is being sidelined and ignored because that right is is so well established in international law at, at this point. So two key uh, aspects, and, and all of this makes sense from a principled sense. We're talking about really the basics of minority and indigenous people's rights, but also we're also talking from a pragmatic one because it's only through active participation uh, that we can all uh, draw lessons and learn about uh, sustainable land and natural resource management uh, from uh, minority and indigenous communities' traditional knowledge. Now, whenever I speak about these issues, uh, I, I do need to underscore the importance of looking at intersectional uh, discrimination. Uh, minority and indigenous people, uh, women, people with disabilities, other marginalized groups in these communities, and their particular exclusion, form of exclusion and vulnerabilities, uh, ensuring their meaningful participation, their access to information, and also access to livelihoods that are safe and decent, and access also to the information needed in disaster mitigation and management. Well, I'll draw my uh, comments uh, to a close. Um, while a lot more attention, as we've heard from Susanna, uh, is needed on indigenous people's land rights and the right to a healthy environment, um, with regard uh, to the statement about Roma rights, one thing I really notice about is uh, that the international community is even more silent on the connections, needs, and rights of minorities. Um, climate impacts on minorities just don't get the same attention in international media or by states. Whereas when we at Minority Rights Group look around the world, it's, the connections are really clear in terms of climate justice and minority rights. We just need to look at urban minorities, whether in Europe or in other regions, the impact of living in informal housing in terms of um, uh, the risks uh, of lands being prone to flooding, landslides and so on, uh, looking along coastal areas, uh, fisher communities uh, that are often very marginalized, often belong to minorities themselves, are affected by coastal erosion, destruction of mangroves, overfishing, or minority smallholding farmers that are affected by agribusinesses uh, and the other natural resource extraction. The links are very clear. So I'd like to end by thanking the organizers for bringing in exactly this, both the indigenous and the minority perspective when we're looking at these issues. Uh, thank you very much, Carol, uh, for for uh, raising up this uh, this question or this issue. Uh, and I think we will also get back to it uh, in our Q and A section. And now uh, I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Natalia Kobilart, uh, an environmental law specialist and senior lawyer at the Registry of the European Court of Human Rights. Natalia, uh, indigenous peoples legal battles to prevent harm to the ecosystems that they have cared for and preserved since uh, time immemorial or to be uh, compensated for harm already caused are starting to change the way in which birds and people in general view the world. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, does not expressly uh, protect the right to a clean, safe and healthy environment, yet the European Court of Human Rights uh, has been increasingly confronted with these issues. Uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, has also dealt with uh, many cases concerning indigenous people's rights to the environment, 
and has developed groundbreaking uh, case law that uh, could be a powerful inspiration to European states. Uh, what can we learn from the case law of these two crucial jurisdictions and how can this help us to define new standards in protecting uh, environmental rights in Europe? Uh, the floor is now yours. I'll be sharing uh, my, my thoughts with uh, the esteemed co-panelists as well, so thank you. Um, I just I want to take this conversation to a different level or look at the situation uh, from a different angle rather because the entity one entity that shares the vulnerability and the unprivileged uh, position of minorities and of indigenous people is the nature uh, are the elements of the environment the ecosystems so uh, I would like to take you on a, on a very short but a different journey to show you how this, um, uh, the interests of indigenous people and minorities and ultimately everyone else overlaps with the interests of nature. So I would like to show you, uh, I would like to raise four points and show you four slides. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, is it working? Can you see my slides? Yes, I think we can see it. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, um, yes, I'll, I would like to, um, from my experience with the European uh, Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and my study of the Latin American uh, jurisprudence of high of superior courts, I would like to uh, tell you how uh, the legal paradigms have changed uh, through the practice of, uh, of cases brought by indigenous peoples and minorities. So uh, just as a, as a way of introduction, a little bit of theory, we have three uh, legal approaches to the everything, to the interactions between human rights and, and the environment. And first of all, this is anthropocentrism. You might have heard this term, especially strong or extractive anthropocentrism, which is traditionally at the core of human rights. The center of the attention is a human being. This is a very egocentric or individualistic approach. So nature, if it is protected by means of human rights, this is very incidental and only uh, nature has, a, has an instrumental value, is viewed as a, something that has a utilitarian value and this is why it can be protected uh, by proxy of human rights. So this is the traditional paradigm that nowadays is being changed. And like I said, uh, through uh, mainly uh, the, uh, the practice uh, brought uh, related to indigenous people's rights. So uh, we have now uh, a new approach, which is called immersive anthropocentrism or weak uh, anthropocentrism, by which still the nature is viewed as um, as as a means of uh, survival for people as a guarantee of our well-being and good conditions of living, a certain environmental quality which is necessary for our full enjoyment of, of the whole panoply of human rights. But still, the understanding here in this approach is uh, deeper, I suppose, the, the deeper understanding of interconnectedness between humans and the natural world. Uh, so here we are, uh, we, we may talk about ecosystem services that are far reaching. Not only nature is not only providing us with healthy environment, but also with the cultural services, with, uh, with food, with uh, stabilization of climate. So different aspects. And uh, we start understanding how, uh, how deeply we depend on the healthy environment, not only as us living here today uh, on the planet, but also our future generations. So the principles of international environmental law that come into play here are those of intergenerational equity, sustainable development, precautionary principle. So the approaches of using the environment, uh, but to the limited extent, limited by the needs of future generations. And then finally, uh, we have ecocentrism, 
And the ecocentrism is the philosophy that is emerging right now in the, in the law uh, across the world, especially non-Western societies. You will I'll give you some examples in a minute. But here we have uh, the approach where, by which nature is protected is protected for its intrinsic value. So, irrespective of what kind of utility it may have to humans. So humans are an integral part of the natural environment, but they are not privileged. So in other words, we are one element of the ecosystem, we are one element and, uh, of, the, of, uh, of the services. We are important, but not the most important. The, the, the whole environment, is not, nature is not around the human being, but we are one part there together with the non-human species. So uh, principles of in dubio pro natura, meaning that in case of doubt, uh, each legal decision should be uh, for the environment, for the protection of nature. And all these, uh, all three paradigms actually com are components or are approaches that are clearly visible in the right to a healthy, clean, sustainable and safe environment. Uh, this right has uh, this duality to it, meaning that it can be viewed uh, from the anthropocentric perspective uh, as a right of humans to enjoy a healthy environment, but also in this ecocentric approach as the right uh, uh, of, of nature, as the right of the environment, as a matter of fact. So uh, these three uh, notions and these three legal paradigms are at the core of what we call now environmental rights and ecological rights. So ecological rights are clearly based on the e ecocentrism, whereas environmental rights are somewhere in between uh, immersive anthropocentrism, ecocentrism, and this strong anthropocentrism. Uh, the picture here that you see uh, shows this, this, those three notions as circles, but we have arrows as well because all of this is very dynamic and there are interactions happening between the three spheres. And uh, this is how also the European Court of Human Rights and at the beginning the Inter-American Court of Human Rights could in fact uh, examine cases related to the environment even though there was no right to a healthy environment uh, expressly provided by the convention, by the respective conventions, simply because there are those interactions and links between the uh, the enjoyment of human rights and the um, the state of the environment. So um, we, at the beginning, and especially the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, it's is very anthropocentric. Uh, clearly, the, the focus is a human being, and here I cite um, the most important cases. There are hundreds of cases concerning the environment that have been uh, examined by the European Court of Human Rights, but they mainly stem from, from uh, pollution, from extractive activities, from industry, from uh, waste management, from, uh, from uh, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution which affected the local communities. And these communities, largely, they were not indigenous. They were people living in cities or in, in rural areas, but they were general population. So uh, in these cases, the court has protected the environment, but um, sort of incidentally, if you wish, the primary, tar the primary focus was a human being, a human victim who was suffering from from a particular pollution or nuisance, uh, to, which caused impacts uh, uh, on health or simply on the well-being of a person. There are some exceptions, very few exceptions, where nature is recognized as an important general interest. So the violation was found, uh, or, or the, the whole context of the case was actually the general system of protecting the environment. For its, own, for its value, not as a resource, but uh, protecting endangered species of turtles, for example, in Greece. And uh, the court was um, had to balance the interests of the economy, of development, of uh, bringing tourists and some uh, hospitality activity to a particular region. But on the other hand, uh, the, it had to balance the interests of nature, of the protection of species in a natural protected zone. Uh, same goes for um, for the case uh, where 
fishing rights were limited because of the protection of, of the ecosystem, of the maritime ecosystem and, and ultimately uh, migratory birds. So in general, the European Court's uh, approach to, um, to the environment is of, uh, of anthropocentric uh, type and, uh, and only incidentally a, a wider protection is offered to the environment uh, when, uh, when the court uh, orders general measures in order to prevent uh, future violations. The situation is sorry, different. Sorry to interrupt, Natalia. I will just ask you to finish in a bit. Yes. Okay. So just to finish up, yes, the a different approach uh, has been taken uh, gradually by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, where cases were brought by indigenous communities, and here you I list the names of cases. And it, what is interesting and what is different from the European Court of Human Rights is that uh, the um, Inter-American Court has recognized collective property of indigenous communities and uh, with it linked the right to self-determination of these communities and also a right to dignified life. So this is something that the European Court has not recognized uh, as of today. Dignified life meaning the conditions, enhanced uh, conditions of, uh, of uh, well-being for, for the people being so closely connected to, the na to nature and being affected to a greater degree by uh, some extractive activities, by, by industry, by oil extraction in their territories. Um, the European Court has only heard one case of indigenous people, but I, I suppose I will get back to this case to you later. So finally, the ecocentrism, this is the, the this third uh, paradigm, this third approach, and this is now being developed uh, throughout the courts and constitutions and parliaments across the world, mainly in the non-Western countries. So here I cite the whole list of, of very new, very recent case law, as you can see, again from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It is important to, uh, to note, and I will end with this, that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has recently recognized um, the right to a healthy environment as an autonomous, self-standing right. It derived it from Article 26 of the American Convention, which guarantees uh, the rights uh, to, um, uh, to progressive development, social, economic, and, and cultural rights. So through this, the right to a healthy environment is now present in the case law and in the system of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And then all those cases uh, in which uh, the courts have taken an ecocentric and anthropocentric approach side by side. On the one hand, finding violations of individual rights of communities living along the, the banks of a river that was become that, that became polluted or in the Amazon forests. And on the other hand, the violations of the rights of nature itself. The rights, the right to be protected, the right to be preserved, and the right to be able to regenerate. So uh, you see um, this interconnectedness between humans and nature has been practically and pragmatically recognized by, by about a dozen of jurisdictions right now. So I will leave you with this idea uh, for, the, for our next part of the, of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, this was also very interesting, and I think uh, we should remain humble. And uh, yes, Homo sapiens is just one element in uh, on this planet, and uh, we should not be uh, anthropocentrical. So it's interesting because I, I think uh, some of us in this room uh, are uh, ecocentrical, but uh, from today, at least me, I know that uh, it's this term, and we can be we can call ourselves like like this. So that is very interesting. And uh, now uh, we will start taking questions and answers from the audience in a few minutes. If you are following on BlueJeans uh, events and would like to ask one of the speakers a question, please use uh, the Q&A function. It's uh, at the right uh, side of this application. And in the meantime, I would like to give uh, each of the speakers an opportunity to react briefly to each other's contributions. Uh, just please uh, try to be brief and um, let's say let's say two minutes uh, each to pick up uh, on anything that uh, struck you about what they said, similarities that surprised you or lessons from their experience that could be 
of interest also to your work um, or a question you would like to ask uh, them yourself. So now, uh, Susanna, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, for all of your uh, presentations. Uh, really interesting to, to hear your work. Um, um, I just wanted to add to, to Natalia's uh, presentation the, the, the shift of the, the legal paradigm. Um, and this, um, these worldviews. And as I, I finished, I, I talked about um, the recognition of, of indigenous knowledge within the international fora and the work on uh, climate change adaption and, and uh, sustainable use of biodiversity. Um, and as I said, uh, since indigenous knowledge is formally recognized, so is our worldview as well. And Natalia's uh, presentation and uh, talking about the immersive anthropo anthropocentrism and, and ecocentrism shows that uh, this is uh, this is uh, definitely true and happening. And we have lived sustainable with uh, the environment for millennia. Our interconnected uh, interconnectedness and with nature and our relationship with nature. Um, is ecocentric, um, yes. But I, I just wanted to to add to that. So thank you, Natalia, for for that. Thank you very much, Susanna, for for your comment, and uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, now uh, Florin can take the floor. Uh, continuing the same idea. Uh, we still have uh, an 18th century image about Roma. Who are the Roma? The ones who are dancing, the ones who are playing, and the ones who are live in close connection with the nature in the woods, blah, 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 you know, this whole story. Yeah, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, Roma are basically denied basic human rights, and they live in this kind of very condition. So here is two opposed situations that I <laughs> I uh, could see from this kind of presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Florin. Thank you very much. And now, Carol, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and again, thanks to all of the speakers. I, I really enjoyed uh, this um, panel discussion so far. If I maybe um, uh, discuss a bit, Natalia, what you were talking about and problematize a bit what your, your, uh, the themes you're pulling out. Of course, myself, I see this, these moves within uh, international law as, as incredibly positive. Um, the move to recognize um, uh, the the uh, ecocentrism, as you say, the the uh, right to a healthy environment, and so on. But I think we have to be very cautious in this direction because, very sadly, uh, there are lots of powerful forces that are using um, that direction as an argument uh, to force indigenous peoples, especially, but also minorities of their traditional land. And here I'm uh, referring to a practice that's come to be known as, quote unquote, fortress conservation. So in other words, uh, large scale, often uh, international NGOs who go in with uh, financial support um, to pay for eco guards that are highly militarized in many instances and using um, extreme violence uh, to force force indigenous peoples off their traditional lands. So I think it, it has to really go hand in hand, um, protection of the environment and, and the, the rights of, of the communities affected. And again, going back to the participation rights. I see you're nodding, so I, 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 I'm glad you agree with me. But just to bring up that, that issue, that, that um, it isn't all plain sailing in that direction. Uh, thank you, Carol, uh, for this provoking, a little bit provoking question. So, Natalia, uh, you can react 
for resource. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will I will react to Carl immediately. Of course, you are absolutely right. And again, the key uh, point of ecocentrism is that a human is equally important as a Siberian tiger. You know, it's just we are not more important, but we are equally important. So so uh, the the rights of indigenous communities, tribes, nomadic populations that they need to have access to lands for grazing or for for other purposes which are linked to their lifestyle are, are essential. And we have had cases from the African Court of Human Rights, in fact, two cases, uh, uh, Endoroi's and Ogiek case, in which precisely that happened. Uh, states were, were opening uh, natural reserves or game reserves, and for that purpose, uh, they wanted to relocate uh, uh, people who were using that land, and violations have been found. So yes, you, we have to be really careful. And this is what Susanna was saying, that uh, the threat to, to uh, indigenous communities and to, to anyone really may come equally from environmental damage and environmental degradation as much as from measures of environmental protection. So uh, the rights of uh, informed, free consent, uh, public uh, consultation, first of all, and then consent for indigenous people. This is crucial, of course, and the balance has to be uh, has to be established. This perfect uh, ecological balance, if you wish, which also considers considers people. And I just wanted to. Uh, go, going back to Susanna and perhaps Florin as well, just to end the, that um, by saying that you see uh, perhaps those uh, special indigenous cosmologies and, and attitudes and lifestyles um, showed us that uh, that anthropocentrism is should be immersive and that ecocentrism should should lead our decision making. But at the end, nowadays, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming universal. So the cases that I referred to from Latin America, these are brought uh, under this ecocentric uh, approach by uh, city dwellers, by people who no longer have a, a particular indigenous uh, traditional lifestyle, by people who also realized how important and how, how interconnected we are with the nature. So, um, so thank you very, very much for this opportunity. And, uh, and I'm here to answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Natalia. And uh, thank you all very much uh, to all four of you, uh, to all of our guests, uh, uh, for uh, your very enriching contributions. You have really given us plenty of uh, food for thought. Uh, and I'm now going to open the floor to questions from uh, attendees. Uh, I would like to start by inviting our dear colleague, Edith Estrella. Um, she's a reporter for the Assembly's Committee on Equality and on Discrimination on Combating in Inequalities in the Right uh, to a Clean, Safe and Health Environment. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Edith, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, Chef. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank speakers and the, the chair of the subcommittee on minorities for organizing this uh, webinar on uh, a very important issue. And uh, I would like to also salute the presence of uh, Mamadou Malcolm Chale as a general rapporteur on uh, racism, as there is a clear link between these forms of discrimination and those related to the environment. I'm sure that the the presentations that uh, we are providing put to my report due for debate at the PAC uh, June session and certainly provide more elements to the Parliamentary Assembly's uh, arguments in favor of a Council of Europe instrument to protect the right to a safe healthy and clean environment. My report on uh, addressing uh, inequalities in the, right, uh, in the right to a safe, healthy and clean environment will focus on difficulties in access to environmental rights for minorities, Roma, indigenous peoples, women, young people, as well as for poor and developing countries. It's therefore with great pleasure that I'm participating in this interesting uh, 
uh, webinar. Yes, I have uh, some questions to, to put. Uh, for example, uh, to Carl Soderberg, uh, how are uh, women and people with disabilities in minority communities affected by violations of their rights to a clean, safe and a healthy environment? And what to do public authorities need to do or do better to take account uh, of this? Another question to uh, Natalia uh, Kobilas. How can the standards set by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights inspire the work of the European Court of Women Rights and the legislators across Europe in assuring better protection of uh, environmental rights? Uh, I would like to to put another question, uh, but uh, other questions, but maybe uh, other participants could uh, put. So thank you for your attention, and I wish you a fruitful debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Edith, for your comments and questions. Uh, and before I pass the floor to all the speakers to, uh, so they can react to Edith's uh, question, there is also one question in the q and I remind all of you who are watching this um, that you can uh, that you can uh, also ask a question using the q and a button on the right side of this uh, application. And I will just read out loud the question, and it's a question to Florin, and I will ask him to uh, answer all uh, quest uh, both questions from from Edith and from this uh, from from our audience. And the question says: uh, Is there a strong Roma civil movement fighting for their environmental rights? Are Roma women impacted uh, in a different way by environmental racism? Thank you. Uh, and so now uh, let's start with uh, Carl. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, so uh, marginalized groups within minorities and indigenous peoples uh, will be uh, affected in a, a wide uh, variety of ways. And, and it's a bit hard to generalize because it will really depend on the community and the context in question. Uh, for instance, it might have to do with uh, livelihoods. Uh, what kind of livelihoods and roles, uh, for instance, minority women, indigenous women uh, play in those communities? Um, I think it's it's very well established, for instance, when facing, uh, and sorry if I'm taking a bit more of a global perspective, uh, but um, uh, desertification, that if women have a traditional role of collecting water for the communities, they're having to go uh, far longer distances and uh, possibly then risking um, uh, added risks, for instance, sexual violence and so on. Um, uh, similarly, with uh, people with disabilities, uh, they may uh, find it difficult to maintain their traditional uh, livelihoods and roles in the confrontation of, uh, with environmental degradation and uh, climate change. Um, Fundamentally, again, I get back to participation rights. If there is a, a, an issue with the lack of uh, respect for the right of participation of minorities and indigenous peoples in the decision making on these issues, if they aren't present at the table, then there's even more risk. Uh, that women, people with disabilities belonging to these communities are even farther from the table, so to speak and may not have access uh, to the information, to the discussions, the debates, and so on uh, in a meaningful way. Um, I'd also like to add um, the issue of disaster uh, mitigation and management. Um, I've uh, read countless reports, very tragic reports, for instance, of minority and indigenous persons with disabilities being uh, even more vulnerable to the impacts of, of uh, large-scale disasters, that they cannot evacuate themselves in time and therefore um, uh, risk injury or even worse, uh, death. So essentially, um, I'm sorry I'm talking very broad brush because 
bringing an intersectional lens to these issues, in fact, requires focusing also uh, on the particularities, on the situations uh, of uh, various marginalized groups within each and every community and what they themselves are facing. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. And now let's uh, give the floor to Natalia. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for this question, indeed. Um, well, the only way uh, that the European Court of Human Rights can uh, change or adjust or uh, make uh, evolve its case law and uh, take into consideration uh, the perhaps the dissolutions uh, that were uh, that were invented uh, or, or put together by other courts is through its case law. So, in fact, uh, the court um, on a case by case basis uh, can uh, can put forward some uh, some fundamental principles. Uh, so um, simply, if there are new cases concerning climate change, we now have two, uh, and you have heard that we have communicated the latest one uh, against Switzerland uh, just days ago. Uh, we have a case uh, against 33 member states brought by, by Portuguese youth. So these are two cases concerning specifically climate change mitigation, even though they are not in the indigenous or minority context, but there is a context of discrimination there of, of uh, either older people or youth. Um, but uh, also, I mean, we would need cases of indigenous people, of minorities who live close to the environment and who would complain about what Susanna was saying so the negative impacts of, uh, of environmental action or, or um, environmental degradation. So we have uh, uh, one contrast is there was one inadmissibility decision that we issued long, long time ago in 83, in fact, uh, in a case against Norway. And this was a case brought by two uh, labs uh, from Norway. One was a reindeer shepherd and the other one was a hunter and fisherman. And they were complaining about a hydroelectric dam that was going to be put uh, in the area where which they were using for grazing, for hunting, for fishing. And in that case, uh, like I said, very long time ago, the court said that um, the traditional use of land for grazing was not a property right. So uh, this, you see, is in a striking contrast with the approach taken since the 80s by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, in which indigenous people have been granted uh, this uh, collective property. Of course, the, the, there is a difference between the two systems, uh, the European systems, system offers protection to minorities, but through individual rights, where the, the inter-American system uh, accepts those collective uh, dimensions of, of many rights, especially second generation rights. So we, we will have to wait and see, I suppose, for new cases to be brought from the Arctic, from the indigenous people um, of Europe, and not only, uh, but uh, new cases concerning uh, the protection of the environment, and this way, the court could then uh, revise, review um, it, its, its case law in this respect. Thank you, Natalia. And now Florin, and uh, I will ask, I will give him more time, three minutes, uh, let's say, to, to react to both questions from Madame Edith Estrella and from the from the audience. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, is there a strong Roma civil movement uh, for environmental rights? Well, I dream of it. <laughs> At the moment, you cannot say that there is a, a Roma movement for the environmental rights uh, per se. But let me say that uh, this kind of en environmental issues, environmental hazards, and this type of discrimination has been on the agenda for many, many years because these kind of communities are very visible and striking. But this uh, was under the somehow human rights approach or poverty alleviation approach. So the problem was there. There was a discussion about it, but not there was not a strong movement uh, now, what I see from the um, uh, in the in the in the last months, I see a strong uh, interest from Roma leaders, from Roma 
even from donors to push this kind of Roma movement and uh, related to the environment. And I hope this will grow, honestly. Uh, another thing that I would, to, I would like to add is that in Europe, you know, there is this green transition and there, is, there will be this kind of uh, funding opportunities available. And I hope that, uh, I don't know, Roma or non-Roma NGOs will take this opportunity to address these kind of issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Florin. And uh, now we will uh, pass to Susanna. Uh, but uh, there is uh, also one question to you from the audience in the Q&A section. And so I will uh, read it out loud. Uh, you raised the need to give more value to indigenous knowledge when it comes to environmental rights and climate change, and this is uh, so important. Uh, how can national authorities and international organizations do better at this? So, Susanna, I will give you also three minutes so you can react. The floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, first, I, I want to, to add to, to Florin's discussion on environmental justice and waste and pollution. That um, That's why it's so important that we highlight the justice aspect um, and that the, a larger focus has to be put on, on, on groups and peoples in relation to justice to prevent distribution. Uh, developments that are unjust. And also, Carl, thank you for, for raising the, the conservation aspect. It is a paradox that um, stemming from climate change and mitigation and, and conservation efforts, the ones who are met with demands for reduction from authorities, like, for example, reindeer husbandry, um, that um, <clears throat> are met with demands for reducing the herds, or traditional fishermen, and hunters that are um, faced with uh, with quotas and national regulations, um, and equal with um, the conservation of areas that push indigenous peoples off their lands in the name of of conservation. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, so back to the question on on how to um, um, value indigenous knowledge. Um, from uh, national authorities uh, and international organizations' perspective. Um, to respect and include indigenous knowledge is, is crucial, yes. But I also want to highlight this is also includes so much more than, than just knowledge about the environment and, and, and um, what we have experienced um, from generation. It also includes our values and world, worldviews. So it's so much more than just a knowledge aspect. What we need to do in society, we have to listen, include and value what indigenous people say. Knowledge is power, but the definition of knowledge is embedded in relations and power balances and structures where ours is defined less important, even though formally recognized within many forests. The one part, um, could be to strengthen indigenous people's institutions and competence centers that actively work with this, strengthen these institutions so our networks of knowledge holders can grow and become strong partners. Um, but also within research programs, I would like to see um, that it should be mandated to seek partnerships with indigenous peoples in projects that are aimed to bring knowledge. So in general, a co-production of knowledge approach should be mainstreamed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna. And uh, now I cannot see quest any questions in the Q&A section. So maybe I, I will uh, ask uh, all, all four speakers, uh, because uh, we are, we are a seminar uh, for World uh, Democracy Forum, uh, and there are also people from Council of uh, Europe. So maybe I will ask uh, if you could make one recommendation to the Council of Europe states uh, about how to strengthen the protection of minorities and indigenous peoples when it comes to environmental rights and climate change. And what would you, uh, what, what, what the recommendation of yours uh, would be? 
so uh, so maybe we can start from the other direction. Uh, maybe the first one, Susanna, now. Um, I would like to to go back to uh, what Carl said and uh, respect um, indigenous peoples' land rights. So speaking from a Sami perspective, free prion and, and, and informed consent means that we need that free prior and informed consent when it comes to any intrusion planned on our homelands. And that is real and meaningful participation, influence, and also consent. That is everything. And there are needs for enhancing Sami influence as well as improving consultation procedures in regard to land management issues. But consultation is only a weak form of influence. So what we really need is the implementation of FPIC, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples clarifies that consultations must be carried out when planning land use on, on Indigenous Peoples' lands. And it also underlines the importance of FPIC as part of self-determination. So there is no other solution that would provide for our needs greater than the right to say yes. But for that, we need time and resources. And as FPIC explains, informed, highlights that we should have the right to give consent based on well-grounded information. But once again, in the end, without us having a possibility to give or withhold consent, any attempts at, at dialogue are pointless. So my recommendation is um, to, to implement um, international law principles. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your final remarks, Susanna. And now, we, now I will give the floor to Florin. Uh, there was a second uh, part of the question about Roma women impacted in different way by environmental racism. Uh, I do not have any evidence to say yes or no. Uh, and it depends, I think, very much on the type of environmental hazard or uh, on the type of the, you know, existing conditions. For example, if we uh, say that uh, there is a seasonal work and uh, men are out for three months or six months uh, while women stay home with the children, well, of course, the impact on the health would be uh, on would be stronger on women. Uh, but again. In Roma families, there are women who go to work and uh, all day or something like this. So it depends. Uh, coming to the to your question, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we need evidence-based solutions. Uh, as the movement for civil uh, rights of the Roma is growing. I hope it will go also more in this direction of environmental rights. And uh, together with this, also the type of researches and, and data on these kind of situations and on the impact so that we can answer more questions to know how to address better. And then the, the second answer would be we need to strengthen and to really implement the existing re uh, legislation as I said in my example, if you break law, if you break the law and you only receive a small fine, then you are basically encouraged to do it again. <laughs> and uh, also another suggestion would be for every piece of legislation, even if it's not on environment specific, but, but on issues that are related, then in the justification of this piece of legislation, uh, we should add what is the impact on the environment. And I think that's one of the ideas that we'd like to implement in the next period in Romania. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Florian. Thank you. And now I will pass the floor to Karl for his final remark. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, and again, I really want to emphasize how much I've enjoyed uh, this webinar. Um, <clears throat> I think I have to uh, arrive at and conclude with the importance of participation rights, uh, the right to meaningful 
uh, participation. And again, as Susanna said, uh, the right of indigenous peoples to free, prior, and informed consent. Um, around participation rights, there's the issue of access to information uh, in order to be able to participate in exactly in that meaningful way. And I think what's exciting when we look around, and I want to end a little bit more hopefully, uh, what's exciting for me when, when I work on uh, minority rights groups, uh, various reports and so on, is seeing um, community-driven initiatives uh, in terms of gathering information and data about uh, climate and environmental degradation impact. In our most recent annual report, and I do urge everyone, um, if you're interested, to go on to minorityrights.org to look at it, uh, we're seeing how um, indigenous and minority uh, communities are adopting, um, for instance, uh, mobile phone technology in order to share information about and document information about indigenous uh, knowledge, uh, also uh, about environmental degradation and so on. Um, there's an issue to do with mapping um, uh, in terms of uh, both uh, mapping uh, traditional knowledge, but also establishing land rights. And there, too, uh, there's a lot of innovation uh, taking place by communities themselves in terms of uh, then documenting their lands, the knowledge systems that they have about those lands, and what is happening to those lands. So essentially, I would say that governments should support these initiatives, make way for them, uh, don't clamp down on uh, civil society space, uh, which is happening around the world, alas, also with minority and indigenous uh, activists uh, being the victims, um, because that is harming a process of, of generating this knowledge in order to ensure that minority and indigenous communities are uh, taking and able to take uh, a seat at the negotiation table when these issues are being discussed. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. And uh, now is the time for final remarks by Natalia. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, I can only follow up on that, that indigenous people and minorities should be giving the voice, really. And uh, not only when it comes in the form of access to information and then give, being given recognition for the knowledge and for the, for the observations that they may bring to the table, but also when it comes to their access to justice. So I want to stress, yes, that just like the other speakers, that participatory rights are crucial here. But I want to introduce an idea that um, indigenous peoples and minorities, when it comes to the environmental issues, uh, could be viewed both as people who have who have pecuniary interests, who have property interests when it comes to loss of their uh, businesses or their activities, uh, you know, husbandry activities or other activities linked to the natural resources, but also as guardians of the environment, as those people who not only represent their own individual or group interests as humans, but also as those who act in the name uh, of the environment and in this way we could by giving them the voice and giving them access to a court we could then hear their pledges made uh, uh, regarding the environment or sort of on behalf of those non-human entities thank you thank you very much natalia thank you thank you all actually thank you all four uh, speakers um and of course, we would love to continue this conversation, this very interesting debate for for to the end of this day and, and many more. Uh, but our time is uh, running out, so we will have to begin wrapping up. And uh, now I'm honored to invite my dear colleague, uh, Momodu Malcolm Yellow, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly's general reporter on combating racism and intolerance, to present to us uh, his uh, concluding comments. Uh, Mr. Uh, Malcolm, of course, uh, it is impossible to uh, summarize everything that has been said, but uh, what uh, are some of the key takeaways that you will bring with you from today's event? Where do European states need to do better in order to hear and take uh, account of the voices of minorities and 
indigenous uh, peoples when it comes to environmental rights and climate change in Europe? And what can we learn from uh, for the future from uh, the inspiring and challenging insights uh, that our speakers brought us today? Uh, the floor is yours, Malcolm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kopriva. Thank you very much um, for your leadership and, and for organizing this very in, in important event uh, and for the committee, subcommittee on management rights organizing this event and inviting me as the coordinator for the No Hate Parliamentary uh, Alliance, uh, working on these issues, especially when it comes to racism. Um, I want to also take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for um, uh, an exceptional really interesting um, um, input that you came with and I, I really have learned a lot personally and I think it's very important in the work that we do. Um, as you know, climate change is, is, um, is uh, one of the, the main issues that we're dealing with. It's, it's uh, the crisis, it's a climate crisis that we're dealing with. And it, it, it's something that we, the entire world and our time's biggest and most urgent crisis that we have to deal with. <clears throat> but um, at the same time, we have to also understand that there is a link between climate change and climate justice. Um, we have had through our distinguished panelists certain things about, for example, green policies that are meant to address global environmental issues, particularly climate change, often have a negative impact at local level, a negative impact on indigenous people, a negative impact on uh, minorities. And this is something that we need to highlight, that one cannot exist without, the, one cannot uh, succeed without the, looking at the other. Uh, we cannot have climate action without considering climate justice. The two has to go together. Um, racialized and minority communities and indigenous people uh, who are already systematically marginalized, they carry the heaviest burden of the climate and ecological crisis that we're facing today, uh, which further exacerbates already existing inequalities that we know about. Um, and we also know that racialized and, and indigenous, indigenous uh, groups and minority groups should not only be a center of climate action work, but should be leading it. Uh, yet in these spaces where decisions on how to manage this climate change and, and climate action, where, where these decisions are made, the minorities and indigenous groups are excluded totally. We know this both when it comes to uh, uh, an institutional level, but also when it comes to the civil society level. Uh, and this is a problem. We cannot expect effective and sustainable environmental policies on environmental and climate change without including the very people who are most affected by the crisis. Uh, and I think this is something that we've heard from all the panelists uh, that we need to take away, we take with us from this uh, panel conversation. We must challenge ourselves and, and the racist structures that we live in uh, that make these exclusions possible. And we must do better. And even if it means sometimes doing better means that, you know, changing our organizational culture, changing our structures, changing our ways, we must learn to recognize the intersections between climate change, climate action, and climate justice. We must learn to understand the intersection. We must do better. And sometimes that might also require sharing power and giving space to create more equitable share of the body, as it was mentioned today earlier on. And I also um, think also it's important uh, to, for us to be, try to be inspired and learn from the indigenous and minority groups' relations with the environment, um, uh, rather than seeing them as, as uh, or exclude them, excluding them from this, this process. And finally, um, I would also like to just mention a couple of things that I think should be also be a, something that we should take away from this conversation. Uh, the first thing is we need to take into consideration the ind indigenous uh, people and minority perspective when addressing environmental issues. And these communities should have a place at the table where the decisions are made. They should be able to take part in decision making at all levels. And the international community is increasingly taking action against climate change. We see that every day, but it remains silent on the rights of minorities and indigenous people and how these rights are violated systematically. We need to guarantee a right to meaningful participation. Indigenous people and minorities must have the question uh, of address to information also needs to be addressed. So we cannot, um, uh, the, the right to have their say on decisions that concern them. We cannot uh, make decisions without making sure that they're involved. As it is said, nothing about us without us. And that is something that I think is extremely important in this particular case. 
Number two takeaway is we need to take into account the intersectionality uh, or the intersectional perspective in this uh, issue. And the third thing I wanted to also add is we need to address misinformation. We've heard about the Roma negative stereotyping and blaming of vulnerable groups, victim blaming. We need a clear image, accurate information on the actual situation. We cannot blame the victim. Four, data, quantitative information is lacking um, and, and it's very much needed. Without data, we will not be able to understand the situation. So community gather information initiative with mapping data on local environment data and so on are also particularly interesting in this respect because there are many, many local communities that collect data and they know the environment, they know exactly what is happening and we need to make sure that we take this data and use it uh, in the work that we're doing with the environment. And lastly, uh, com we need to combine traditional or reinterpreted anthropocentric approaches to environmental rights and uh, an ecocentric approach. We cannot only look at the human centric approach, we need to look at the ecocentric approach in the work that we do because that brings, uh, uh, that makes our work more effective when it comes to combining or having environmental action. Uh, and finally, 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 let me thank you all for this very, very interesting conversation. And please remember, we must see the link between environmental action and environmental justice. No environmental action without environmental justice. And environmental action can only succeed with environmental justice. You cannot have one without looking at the other. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very, very much, Mamadou Malcolm. Uh, for those stimulating takeaways and final comments, and I hope uh, we finished uh, op rather optimistic, because it's what I want uh, all of you to take it. Because we we need uh, each of us to to fight for this. Uh, what was just said. So today's event has been truly inspiring and as well as uh, challenging. And I would like to thank all of uh, our speakers for their very high quality input. Uh, you have been frank, open, and honest about the challenges you face, about where governments and parliaments are failing minorities and peoples, and how much work our democracies have to do to ensure uh, that the voices of minorities and indigenous peoples are not only heard, but listened to and uh, taken on board. This is very important. I would also like to thank uh, Mrs. Sadit Estrella and all those who asked additional questions and who thereby took our conversation further. It has been a real privilege to share this uh, discussion with you. I would like to thank the colleagues from the Council of Europe Secretariat, without whose work this event could not uh, have taken place, the secretariats of the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination in the Parliamentary Assembly, and of the World Forum for Democracy, as well as many other staff who provided essential logistical support. Thank you very much. And now, because there is uh, no such thing as an ending, only new beginnings, I would like to invite all those who were inspired by today's event to take advantage of the excellent website of the World Forum for Democracy in order to catch up uh, on any previous events you may have missed and find out about the next ones coming up. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder, the next event will be this Wednesday, uh, March, 20, uh, March 31st at uh, 10 a.m. Paris time. In it, uh, youth delegates will look at strategies for civil society organizations working on climate change. If you uh, would like to watch today's event again, it will soon be uploaded to the website of the forum as well as to the Assemblies YouTube. Thank you again uh, very much. Uh, take care and uh, hopefully see you soon, uh, even in person, uh, I hope. Uh, uh, take care and uh, have a good rest of the day and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.